Throughout much of the mid-2000s, the team's efforts were focused on validating the measures that we had created and using them to get feedback and establish feedback effects. I can't tell you how excited we were, and we weren't the only ones, of course. There were lots of teams working on how we could get feedback to the clinician in order to improve retention and outcome. However, at the same time, we were publishing research studies about the effects of feedback, I began to notice that clinicians weren't learning from the feedback. In fact, the feedback seemed to function a bit like a GPS. First off, the GPS had to be on. If the GPS wasn't on, then no feedback was given, and there were a large number of clinicians who heard about the measures, even took them home, used them a few times, and then stopped. More curiously, when clinicians did use the feedback, we were finding not all benefited. Most important, however, listening to the GPS failed to help clinicians appreciate the geography that they were driving through with their particular client. It's the same as if you're using the GPS in your car. Yes, it gets you to the destination if you listen, but it really doesn't help you learn to navigate without that particular tool. As a clinician from the earliest days, what I really wanted to do was get better and better at my craft. Now, I know I'm not alone in that. There's a ton of research, for example, by Runestet and Orlinsky that shows that this is what drives therapists. This is what keeps them in the business, a sense of professional growth. But for me and for others, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't an illusory growth, that I wasn't thinking I was getting better when I really wasn't. And I had concerns about that from our research on feedback. Once again, how did we know this? Well, therapists' outcomes, their ability to detect the feedback message didn't get better over time. In other words, they were using the tools consistently, and yet their ability to detect when their clients were off track didn't seem to improve. More importantly, and also of great concern, was that a decline effect started to enter into the research literature. There were studies coming out that didn't seem to be as positive, that didn't say that feedback was as helpful as the original studies indicated that feedback could be. Van Owen, Amble, De Jong, Chow and Liu, and others began to show that either the feedback had a smaller effect or no effect at all. So clearly, just like the GPS example, if we wanted to help therapists learn the geography to get better, to reach my goal of continuous professional development, one additional step had to take place. We really combed through the literature. The evidence with regard to supervision, while it indicated that therapists loved the process, did not indicate that supervision led to enhanced client outcomes. Let me say that again. Supervision, while we all appreciate it and enjoy it, there was virtually no evidence that it led to improved outcomes. S similar story can be told about continuing education workshops. No evidence whatsoever that attending continuing education events led to improved client outcomes, that it led to therapists getting better at their craft. Then as life sometimes have it, I stumbled across some research that was being done by a Swedish psychologist whose name is Anders Ericsson. Reading through his work on expertise really opened my eyes. I'd never heard of him. Anders Ericsson was doing most of his work with elite athletes, with bankers, people from the financial industry, folks who had to get better year after year and do so in a documented fashion. Anders Ericsson talked about a particular thing that these elite performers did that led to continuous growth in their performance. What did those elite performers do? These elite performers took the time to reflect on their performance, 
looking specifically for errors and mistakes, areas where they could fine-tune what they did unconsciously, develop a plan, execute that plan, and then start over once again. And they did this continuously, day after day, week after week, year after year. The improvements in their performance weren't dramatic. Rather, they were small improvements, hour by hour, as they applied this formula of reviewing, identifying errors, developing a plan, executing that plan, and reflecting on that plan. For me, exposure to Erickson's ideas made it clear that measurement was a part, but only a small part of the equation in professional development. In fact, if you look at the research literature, the data basically say that we don't get better with time and experience. I was part of a study that is the largest study on experience published in the literature to date. Headed by Simon Goldberg, we tracked therapist outcomes over a five to 17 year period. Let me say it again. We tracked therapist outcomes for a five to 17 year period. Each therapist measured their outcome at every visit with all of their clients. Each therapist could, if they wanted to, look at the outcomes to determine which clients were on and off track. The question was, did the clinicians get better with time and experience and exposure to feedback alone? What we found, in fact, is that overall, therapist outcomes declined year after year, not by huge amounts, but enough so that within 10 years, they'd lost all of the effectiveness they originally had when they first started.